My name's Zach Judd. I'm the Director of Education at Florida Oceanographic Society, and I, I'm thrilled to see such an incredible audience tonight. Every week, I ask you to bring a friend, or if you're watching on Zoom, I ask you to invite a friend, and, and it's paid off. Believe it or not, each week that we've done this so far this year, our audience has grown and grown and grown. So last week, believe it or not, we had 130 people here at the Blake Library. We also had 203 watching on Zoom. So over 300 people joined us for Dr. Herzing's lecture last week about dolphin behavior in the Bahamas. If you missed that one, it was a really good talk. She is a, an entertainer and an incredible scientist, and her lecture will be up on our website. If it's not up there today, it'll probably be up there within the next day or so. So if you missed last week's presentation, please check it out on our website, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Tonight's special guest speaker, Dr. Josh, Josh Voss, is an associate research professor at Florida Atlantic University's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. Dr. Voss holds a bachelor's degree from Elon University and a PhD from Florida International University. He's also a certified technical rebreather diver who's completed more than 1,500 scientific dives and has led more than 40 scientific expeditions. Through Harbor Branch's Robertson Coral Reef Program, Dr. Voss and his team work to discover, characterize, and protect our critically imperiled coral reef ecosystems. Tonight, he's going to be telling us all about that work. It is with great pleasure that I welcome to the stage my good friend, Dr. Josh Voss. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. Um, it's great to be back down here. I gave a talk in the Blake lecture series probably five years ago, and then as most of you know, it went on a bit of a hiatus, but it's great to see it back and great to see so many people here in the room, and I'll be happy to stick around as long as I possibly can this evening to answer all of your questions, even though the library will close on us promptly at eight, remember that. <laughs> so I, I want to start off by thanking uh, a huge number of people that contribute to this work. So as most of you might guess, Taking part in these big ocean-going expeditions requires a huge team of people. The ones that are uh, most important in my group are the ones listed up here on top. These are all of the graduate students and technicians that have worked with me for really the past 15 years or so. Those with asterisks are ones that have recently graduated and all moved on to future positions in science. Those without are all ones that are still working with me. So I'm going to try to my best to highlight um, individual projects that these students are involved with as well. Um, and if you're interested in getting someone in your life involved in graduate school, please uh, reach out to me about that afterwards as well. At Harbor Branch, we have a great group uh, that works together on coral reef uh, exploration and characterization. Uh, one of the most important is John Reed, who recently retired, but we're not going to let him go that eas easily. I'll be pulling him in on projects uh, as time goes forward. And then most of this work has been collaborative in nature. And that's usually with a direct agency or with other universities or some combination thereof. And one of the reasons having that combination with the agencies at the outset is really important is if you want to have research that leads to management goals, doing all of the data collection and then dumping it on the, on the managers afterwards isn't going to work. What you have to do is, from the outset, get them involved in your process so that you know you're generating information that's going to become actionable to them, not just something that goes into the ether. So we've worked really closely with uh, NOAA's Marine Sanctuaries Program, as well as Florida DEP, FWC, and other agencies throughout the country and state. And then lastly, we couldn't do any of this work without really dedicated and talented ship crews that are all listed here on the bottom. Um, and the support of family to let us go and do these crazy things for weeks at a time. Uh, so my wife and kids, I really appreciate their patience and tolerance. Um, what I appreciate even more is that every night, my kids grill me about my work way more than my program officers from the agencies do. It's great. They want to know what progress we've made, whether or not that paper got published or not. It's hilarious. Um, and tonight, in particular, I'm grateful to have my parents and my aunt and uncle here. So it feels a little bit like sixth grade-ish. Um, but uh, it's rare that I get those opportunities, so it's great that you guys are here. And it won't be like middle school. I won't expect like a big camcorder up on your shoulder anytime soon. So I'm hoping, quick show of hands, who's familiar in general with what the notion of a coral reef is? Keep them up if you've seen one for yourself. Keep them up if you've seen one for yourself in Florida. 
We're at about half. That's great. Fantastic. Look around the room, spot the people that didn't raise their hands, take them out to go see it here in Florida. It's fantastic. Most of our reefs are in good shape, particularly if you get into these, some, of these, some of these deeper areas. Areas of terraces of coral that support vast biodiversity, fisheries, and lots of productivity, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and giving it into food chains that produce all the kinds of biota that we see. Unfortunately, excuse me, and so all of these things are a result of this coral symbiosis. So corals have these small, tiny dinoflagellate algae that live inside them. Corals essentially function as farmers, and all of the photosynthesis that that algae does results in them dumping about 95% of the sugar they generate directly into coral growth and reproduction. So we get really high productivity. Productivity ultimately drives something we want to see, which is lots of fish on reefs. So both from a recreational and economic commercial standpoint, those are important things here in Florida and globally. They also drive lots of biodiversity. So whenever you have things that are stuck to the bottom, the way corals are, that are fighting with one another on the bottom, you're likely to get all this kind of diversity that results in those little niches and spaces. As they build up all the calcium carbonate skeleton that they deposit, they also become amazing wave breaks for us. I'm not exaggerating when I say that all of you that live out on the barrier islands of Florida, if we didn't have amazing coral reefs, you probably couldn't get homeowner's insurance at all, let alone at the exorbitant rates it's been lately. Also here in Florida, it drives a huge thriving tourism industry. So we have individual reefs that get more than a million visitors a year, and pretty much the entire Florida Keys economy is driven around uh, keys related, excuse me, reef-related activities, be they snorkeling, diving, or fishing. And then lastly, in addition to driving biodiversity, when all of those organisms on the bottom are fighting with one another, they can't get up and run away. So evolution favors those that ends up making chemical combatants that allow them to fight with one another on the benthos. And that results in all kinds of things that might be potential pharmaceuticals, things like anti-cancer compounds or anti-tumor compounds. Here in Florida, we estimate that our reefs are worth somewhere between eight to $12 billion with a B. Worldwide, it's closer to about 13 trillion in estimated total value. And we know that at the last estimate, which is now approaching almost 10 years old, at least 70,000 jobs were directly supported by coral reefs here in our state. Uh, that estimate's probably much higher now. Our reef extends from up here in Martin County all the way down and around the coast and out to the Dry Tortugas, and in fact, beyond the Dry Tortugas. And I'm gonna talk a bit about that beyond the Dry Tortugas portion later on in the talk tonight. Unfortunately, these great things about corals, the fact that they're highly productive and biodiverse and drive all of these ecosystem services are threatened by a variety of different sources. We know that changes that we're seeing in our climate are driving increasing frequency and severity of storms, increasing frequency and severity of thermal events that disrupt that coral symbiosis. We also know that in order to have the coastal systems that we do, and to keep all of these homes and condos out on the beach, we often have to do beach renourishment. As sand is moved around, that can become a risk to corals as well. Corals can be smothered, they can be sandblasted, um, or ultimately you can even pass pathogens through sediment out onto the reef. A more direct impact can be ship groundings or anchorings. Thankfully, that's one of those things that is abated over time as technology has progressed. Now, most boaters have a GPS in some form that's going to warn them before they, they hit bottom. But anchoring can still be a problem. Um, so recognizing when you should be anchoring or where you should be anchoring is a boater education need that's still certainly needed here in Florida. Overfishing can be a problem. That's historically been a problem in Florida, but has been abated and controlled more so in recent years. Um, what has not abated as much, um, and in fact, uh, Mark Perry just posted about it again this week, is the potential damage that's caused by coastal runoff into our estuarine and then ultimately coastal coral reef ecosystems. So a lot of fingers get pointed to that for estuary problems. And in terms of impacts to the estuary, those are undoubtedly true. However, only about 20% of the discharge from Lake Okeechobee ultimately ends up going out of St. Lucie Inlet and out onto the reefs there. Uh, 
So yes, it represents a problem, but certainly not the only problem that coastal coral reefs in Florida are facing. What's been more of a problem recently, particularly in the past roughly five years, has been the emergence of new coral diseases. So here's an example of black band disease that you can see on the bottom right of the screen. So the healthy coral tissue is that kind of yellowy, mustard-colored looking stuff to the left. You can see a band of black uh, pathogen that's mostly cyanobacteria in that bare white skeleton. So that band will march across the coral colony, destroying the coral tissue and leaving a bare coral skeleton in its wake. This is one of now almost 35 described diseases or syndromes, and one has recently become a huge problem here in Florida, so I'll speak about that this evening as well. When corals die, the structure that they leave behind is still there. Ultimately, what determines the long-term success of coral reefs on an ecological scale, not an individual coral scale, is whether or not this coral then gets replaced by another one, or if baby corals recruit onto it, or if this coral ultimately just becomes eroded down and dies and isn't replaced. And so those are the kind of long-term dynamics that we're looking at on Florida's coral reefs and others to decide, are they going to continue to provide the ecosystem services that we need and want? In other areas where we've already seen dramatic declines below a threshold, you can end up with reefs that look like this. A few sparse corals thrown in there, but a whole lot of macroalgae that have overgrown that system. It's much more difficult for a system like this to recover back to its coral state than a system that has only lost a little bit of its coral tissue. This is driven by two factors, both the fact that we're losing herbivores from too much overfishing and potential nutrient pollution that's driving fertilization of those algae as well. So both of those things need to be managed here in Florida. So ultimately, the question for any given reef is, what are specifically the factors that are driving us from high coral cover to low co coral cover situations? And what can we do to reverse that trend back to increasing coral cover and increasing ecosystem services? And that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. Our approach is really kind of uh, threefold. The first is characterization and monitoring. Getting out there into the environment and either identifying and finding new coral reef resources that are unknown or undescribed yet, or monitoring those that we do know about to see are they changing over time for better or worse and why. Even with that monitoring, you often can't determine with great specificity exactly what the cause of the decline or the cause of the recovery might be. Excuse me. The only way to do that is with discrete controlled experiments. Expose those corals to a, a potential stressor that you're worried about, temperature, low salinity, et cetera, and see how they respond. Then you can have confidence that you can go back to those managers with actionable data that says, if you do this, you can expect an increase in coral survivorship of this. Without that kind of causative data, it's much more difficult for managers or politicians to go out on a limb with resources or a new regulation to make that change. So you have to have both the exploration and monitoring coupled with the experiments. And then lastly, we use a lot of advanced molecular tools. So corals are not the most charismatic organisms, right? No real eyes, no uh, really interesting behaviors other than sticking out their tentacles um, and occasionally eating during the evening. So the best way to look at the overall relatedness, physiology, um, and status of the coral is to look into the tissue itself, whether at the DNA or the RNA or something else that's inside the coral that can give you insight into how that coral is behaving and maybe who its relatives are. And our goal with this combined approach is really three things. First, we want to develop innovative tools, new ways of measuring or looking that we can hand off to our management partners and say, this is really how we should be looking at this rather than just taking pictures and recording what we see. Next, we want to develop both data, but coupled with that data, recommendations to those managers uh, that if you make this change to your water quality, quality policy, for example, here's what you might expect to see change in your coral health in that region. 
And then lastly, since we're a university, um, and since I love teaching and mentoring, a huge role of our group is training and inspiring that next generation. I saw a great graphic when I was first starting as a professor, and it basically was like, no matter what, your influence can grow a little bit, but it can never be as strong as the influence you might have by training literally dozens or hundreds of other people and all of them contributing their expertise as well. So how do we do exploration? Most of the time, it means going out on ships. And over the past, this should now be 13 years, um, we've done 46 different research expeditions, primarily to areas of the Gulf of Mexico, southwestern Atlantic, Bahamas, and wider Caribbean. We've done a few in other locations as well, but the bulk of our work is really focused here in kind of the southeastern corner of the United States and into the Caribbean. We focus primarily on trying to find and describe those areas that are not well known yet. There's two reasons for that. Number one, there's a whole bunch of potential and hypothesized reef area out there that's currently under no management scheme whatsoever. That means there's nothing to prevent people from trawling across the bottom to collect shrimp or dropping lobster pots onto that reef to collect lobster. We can't protect these areas until we know what's there and characterize it well. So that's the first goal. The second reason that we go to these unexplored areas is that we've seen all of these trends of decline in shallow coastal coral reef ecosystems. But are those same kind of trends occurring further afield, away from the coast, in deep oceans on deep reefs? If they are, then we need to respond to that accordingly. If they're not, then perhaps we can do some things to allow those deeper, more protected, healthier reefs to perhaps reseed and rehelp some of our shallow reefs to recover. As a result of this exploration, we've done a whole bunch of discovery, finding whole new reefs that were uncharacterized before, new species or new records of species in particular locations where they've never been seen before, particularly in terms of marine sponges. So Shirley Pomponi and her group we work with very closely. Um, and I'm not exaggerating when I say from an individual expedition, we may come back with nine or 10 sponges that have never before been described by science. And then lastly, again, our goal is to both get off the ship with immediate recommendations to our management partners, but then also to do years of additional data collection, either from imagery and samples that were collected on that mission, or from uh, multi-beam sonar that we collect off the bottom to map things as well. And so we'll both come off the ship with a quick look report of Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Here's what we found. Here's what we think is of immediate interest for protective needs for you. Here's what we're gonna be working on for the next two years that we want your help with and feedback on to improve your management as well. So one of the best Cases of that for us has been with Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Who knew Texas had coral reefs? A couple of you. So arguably the best U.S. coral reef in the Atlantic or tropical western Atlantic is off the coast of Texas. Flower Garden Banks is about 100 miles off the coast of Galveston. It's right on the edge of the continental shelf goes from about 70 feet at the top down to about 350 feet is where the corals start to peter out at the bottom. But they have coral cover approaching 50% or higher. To put that in perspective, Florida Keys is somewhere around like 3%. So a full order of magnitude more coral off the coast of Texas in these one locations um, than we have here. That's on par with things like Bonaire, that's around 55% or Curacao that's about 48%. So it's a really healthy, thriving coral reef. So we've done uh, literally a, more than a decade of almost annual exploration in this area, coupled with both underwater robots, remotely operated vehicles or ROVs, and technical diving. So technical diving just means you're going into decompression on purpose. Most divers try to stick to no decompression limits. That means that they're not gonna accumulate too much nitrogen in their bloodstream so that they didn't have to stop on the way up. We do that on purpose. We let that accumulate in our bloodstream and then we have scheduled stops all the way up. Now we're working with rebreathers where we'll breathe through that same volume of gas over and over again 
The CO2 will get scrubbed out on our back and oxygen will get added back into our loop. It effectively means we can dive for four hours with no break and never run out of gas. It's fantastic. So as a result of this work, not only did we build our technical capabilities, we were consistently making recommendations to the Sanctuary Advisory Council about additional banks that we found, providing them with data and imagery and video from these locations and making recommendations for expansion. I'm very happy to report that at the beginning of uh, 2020, that expansion happened. It went from three initial banks that were protected to 17 banks that were protected, and the total area of, of, that was protected increased almost threefold. So really great success story of getting great exploration and data that results in very quick protection for these coral reefs. The other thing that's really uh, been fascinating working out there is if you're 100 miles offshore, there are no good reliable cell so signals unless you can convince one of the oil rigs out there to let you bounce a cell signal off of them. Um, over time, we've realized that part of the limitation in convincing stakeholder groups or kind of anyone that's buying into our system, aka paying taxes, that there should be an investment in something is they need to see it and be connected to it. And so to help that, we worked with the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration to do the first flyaway telepresence system ever on a small portable ship. So this whole system showed up in a container, we unpacked it out of the container over two days, and we could live stream high definition video off the bottom, through the ship, through, the, through a satellite signal, directly into about 37 classrooms, and to over 8,000 people on every given day um, we're watching live. The real value of that is some of the people that we had watching live were stakeholders on that Sanctuary Advisory Council, people that worked for the fishing industry, people that worked for the oil industry in Houston and Galveston. But once they could see it and interact with it with their own eyes, they recognized the value of that resource, and that's part of what contributed to this success story. So it's not just about the data, it's about the storytelling too. So here's a kind of a picture of what flower gardens looks like. This is down at you know, roughly 80 to 90 feet, huge terraces of coral. In fact, so much coral that's growing so prolifically that huge sheets will just break off and slide down the front of the reef because they're growing so much. Um, what's interesting too is that in contrast to Florida Keys, essentially no octocorals, none of those soft whip corals that are up off the bottom. So a completely different kind of community structure that probably indicates this has never been shallow, which it hasn't, um, and thrives in these kind of lower light environments um, hundreds of miles offshore. So our next success story has been in Cuba. So. Um, we were very fortunate in 2017, after years of working with Cuban colleagues, to get permission from both the United States government and the Cuban government to do a joint expedition with Cuban uh, researchers to do a complete circumnavigation of the entire Cuban archipelago. Um, all in all, we went to 42 sites all the way around uh, Cuba, and by the end of that cruise, essentially every single one of those sites had some amazing deep mesophotic or middle light coral habitat. We didn't come up with really any duds except one that was like anywhere else it would have been great, but because we were so spoiled, we were like, ah, oh, this is fine. <laughs> we literally got off that ship already proposing four new MPAs in Cuba. And by the end of that calendar year, two of those MPAs had already been put into place because we had government representatives from Cuba on board with us during the cruise. So again, that close interaction with management can lead to fast and effective uh, conservation outcomes. What's also really interesting is that we collected coral samples from all the way around Cuba. And I'm gonna show you some additional data here in a bit, but there's really a strong suggestion that Cuba's coral reefs are providing larvae that seed Florida's coral reefs. So there's implications for that both ecologically and in terms of management as well. So here's to give you an idea of what Cuba looks like. Very different from flower gardens, right? 
So we have huge sponges. We've got lots of long sponges and long wire whip corals. Uh, this is a, a, that was a giant zestospongia that was literally taller than me. Um, and lots of areas of these steep faces with lots of these big fan corals. Whenever you see lots of big fan corals, especially turned on their sides like that, it suggests there's high current that's bringing lots of zooplankton and phytoplankton into that system, and those corals are just feeding on it as, it, as they pass through the fans. So really high coral cover, high diversity. Um, this particular area on the southwest coast of Cuba uh, was an area that we suggested for an expansion of an MPA um, that the, the director of conservation for that MPA was one of my coral partners on the cruise. So of course she was on board. It was great. Next story is about Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. So that's the one I'm hoping most of you should be the most familiar with, right? If you haven't made your trip to the Keys yet, I highly suggest everyone goes. It's fantastic. So this is an area that's much more highly studied than either of the other two. There's been truly decades and decades of research work in the Florida Keys, particularly in shallow reef zones. But it's only been recently that we started to probe further into some of these deeper habitats, both through the use of submersibles and through ROVs, human submersibles and ROVs. So Harbor Branch began working there really in the late 70s and identified a few of these areas, but they were really focused on collection for establishing new biodiversity and new species records. They weren't doing big surveys to document the benthos type. So we came back in in 2018 and 2019, both with tech divers and with ROVs, to really improve the amount of mapping that we were doing. And we focused on all these marginal habitats that are just inside of that green kind of dashed line that you see on this uh, figure here to the bottom left. Again, we didn't hit all new coral reef habitat, but we found an awful lot. Particularly in this area called Pulley Ridge, that's a little polygon all the way out to the west there. So the continental shelf continues past the dry tortugas and turns up. And there's this other area called Pulley Ridge um, that's about 260 feet deep. Fishermen have known about it for decades. There have been some studies done on it by USGS back in the early 2000s. We went back to this location and found two really interesting results. The first was that there was a whole area of coral that had functionally been almost wiped out. About 90% of the coral cover that had previously been reported was gone, leaving only 10% remaining. Fortunately, as we started to move further west, that bump out box you see kind of over to the left on that polygon, we found a whole new area of coral that the fishermen didn't know about yet. So we hypothesized that part of the reason we were seeing coral declines in those regions was a result of bottom fishing impacts, both in the forms of traps and uh, bandit reels. In other words, huge weights that are dropped to the bottom with a number of lines off of them. That whole area we were able to get um, expanded in a habitat area of particular concern in 2020. And this was work that John Reed and Dennis Hanisak and I all worked on together. And I'm really happy to report that that whole area is now slated for inclusion in the broader Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary under a proposed rule that's ongoing right now. So hopefully by the end of this year, that will be part of the sanctuary. The other additions to the sanctuary you see are all of these green dotted lines. Essentially, each one of those is an area that we recommended expansion. To the top left of Dry Tortugas off of Sherwood Forest, we did a bunch of dives there, both with the submersible and ROV and divers documenting habitat. In the triangle area um, between this little strip on the bottom called Tor Tortugas Ecological Reserve South and the rest of the sanctuary, we mapped hundreds of coral colonies, um, aka bombies, big, huge, kind of you know, 10, 20 meter high, or excuse me, 10, 20 foot high colonies. Um, in that area. And then as we went back up the coast, we focused on areas in particular that were outside of the existing sanctuary boundary, trying to identify resources that we knew were important and needed to be protected. And thankfully, the Sanctuary um, Advisory Council and the several partners that are involved in Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, it's a much more convoluted dynamic of stakeholders than Texas, if you can believe that. Um, 
they're on board. And so this is all now part of the proposed rule that will protect these additional reef habitats going out further. Um, and really what that's gonna do is prevent major shipping traffic from going through that region and prevent unregulated fishing in that region, hopefully, as well. So again, I mentioned briefly that idea of telepresence. And what was different about that one expedition was using a small, nimble, quick system. But telepresence has really exploded. And we work with NOAA quite a bit on this, mostly through our Cooperative Institute. And telepresence is that notion of you don't have to be there to be actively involved. And it's not just to try to get students excited or try to get the public excited. It's also so that I can provide my expertise on an expedition without having to leave home. Or I can literally be on a different expedition somewhere else and log into the live stream and provide feedback on a different expedition that's going on in a different location. And that's happened twice already. I've been on a ship in the Keys and had to look at video on a ship coming from Flower Gardens and provide input on should we sample this or not. So we've contributed on 23 different NOAA missions. Most of those um, have been on the Okeanos Explorer. This is NOAA's big, dedicated exploration platform. They don't do monitoring. They don't do, quote, research. All they do is exploration and finding new things. That's their primary focus, um, particularly trying to find resources within the USEEZ that we don't know we have yet and how we might manage those resources. We've also done a few of those missions on the Manta, which is a Flower Garden's vessel as well. Um, and out of that, two big kind of things have come. The first is that we now have what's called an Exploration Command Center on the FAU Harbor Branch campus. So it's essentially a bank of really high definition cameras and high speed computers that allow us to interact with that ship in under two seconds. If you wanna watch these live feeds, you can, but you're gonna watch them in standard def and you're gonna watch them with about a 20 second delay. And that's just a cost limitation thing for NOAA, essentially. However, when we're using the high def and that two second delay, it means if there's a coral or some other sponge that we spot, I can immediately notify them, oh, that's an important one, we need to collect it. If I had that 20 second delay, they would literally already be way past it by the time I ever saw it. So that tight timeline is really important. We use the Internet 2 connection for that that runs from Boca all the way up to Fort Pierce. The second big outcome from this is we've developed a whole new graduate course built around telepresence exploration. Essentially, an idea that these students eventually, hopefully, they'll all get out to see themselves. But until they do, this is the next best thing for them to start getting a pseudo axie experience during a course. And we actually treated it like a cruise. They had watches. They had individual responsibilities during those watches. And we kept on the same time as the people on the ship. That gets really challenging when the ship is like five or six time zones away somewhere else. And you're trying to keep students awake at 11 o'clock at night. But you can do it through sugar, coffee, and loud music. So total now, we've had about 400 students participate in our Exploration Command Center, and more than 500 members of the public have come to these open nights that we have where they can come and interact uh, with the Exploration Command Center and live ships as well. So one of the other benefits of going on all of these different cruises and all these different places is that we've started to collect samples to look at essentially connectivity of corals on a big, broad scale. All of coral population dynamics and coral, coral persistence in the environment is really revolving around two things, larval supply and survival of recruits to adult phases. So coral can produce these tiny microscopic little larvae. They can swim on the ocean currents on the order of maybe three to five weeks. And then they settle down into what they hope is the ideal location metamorph into a little polyp and start doing asexual reproduction to build that huge colony. Corals, the adult, is not gonna get up and move to another place. So essentially the only way you can have immigration or population maintenance is at that larval stage. So we've collected corals of several different species across all of these different locations throughout the broader, kind of wider Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico to look for evidence of connectivity. 
which of these reefs are important sources of larvae? Which of these reefs are sinks of larvae that never produce any that help out anywhere else? And if we want to have protections, particularly in Florida, who do we need to work with to make sure that their corals are going to survive to continue to provide us larvae? Or do we even need to think about assisted migration, taking larvae from one place to another, or perhaps even taking fragments of coral from one place to another? If we're going to do that, we want to bring the correct kinds. So knowing the genetics of all of these individuals is really important. So I'm going to give you a few examples of some of these species and what we know so far. The one we've worked with by far the most is Montastria cavernosa. And I'm going to apologize because corals don't have great common names. Unlike fishes or birds or orchids where like everything's curated and there's one common name for one scientific name, totally not the case for corals. We have coral, individual corals that have like eight common names and we have common names that are used for like eight different coral species. So I'm going to stick with the scientific names and um, I'll pronounce, pronounce them slowly and articulately. So Montastria cavernosa is one that's really interesting because it's ubiquitous throughout the western tropical reefs. Um, essentially everywhere throughout the Gulf of Mexico, throughout all of the Caribbean, throughout Florida, from one meter deep all the way down to like 110 meters deep, you're going to find Montastria cavernosa. So we knew it was a first good target for us to look at, are these things connected or not, because we could look for it everywhere. So what we did is we went to all of these different locations and we collected samples of this species in a, in a coordinated fashion in shallow areas and deeper mesophotic areas. So we could look at two levels of connectivity. First, are those deep areas potentially providing larvae to the shallow areas and helping them recover if they are degraded? Secondly, across horizontal space, what levels of connectivity do we see over broad spatial scales? In other words, are the lower keys providing larvae that help the upper keys to survive? So four of my students have been really instrumental in this project. Uh, Lexi is the one that kind of put it all together in just this past year and just finished her PhD about a month ago. So in this chart, what you're looking at for each of these individual boxes, every single line represents a coral colony. And the color on that vertical line tells you which uh, group or race or cluster of that species um, that coral is associated with. So for example, in the top left, top left up there, up there in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, we have two boxes. The up facing arrow is for the shallow corals. The down facing arrow is for the mesophotic corals. And there you can see it doesn't matter what depth you're at. Almost all of the corals are dominated by that kind of dark blue, navy blue, purple color, with some of them also having this lighter blue or yellow clades associated in there too. In other places, we see the exact opposite. So if you come down to off the coast of the Yucatan, you can see really stark differences between the shallow populations and the deep populations, suggesting that they're not well connected, that the deep ones are not providing larvae that get up into those shallow areas. And then what's really interesting is you look at places like shallow Belize down here that's dominated by this green cluster. And perhaps it's not too surprising that you might see larval transport from Mesoamerica to Cuba, where that green moves up into the shallow area. But we actually see it all the way up into southeast Florida as well, suggesting that not necessarily an individual coral larvae could swim from Mesoamerica all the way to southeast Florida. But over several generations, you get this leapfrog effect where ultimately our population of Montastria cavernosa here in southeast Florida probably came from Mesoamerica and Cuba. That's important because it means if we want to manage and help to restore our population here, we're going to be, need to be doing large scale international level regulation and management and conservation, not just our own little patch of protection that won't be sufficient. 
So we've looked at other corals too. This one's Parites asteroides, a small little green or brown lumpy coral that's kind of considered a weedy species here on the coast of Florida. And this one we really wanted to look at because in a time when all of the other corals in Florida were doing really poorly, this one was doing great. And so we wanted to know why is this one doing so great? So we mapped this one all out and we found something that wasn't too surprising. We found a really high level of clonality. In other words, the reason this one could take off and grow so quickly is because it wasn't doing sexual reproduction. It was just fragmenting itself and growing all over the bottom very quickly. What was really interesting though, is that it's like all clones. Out of the 90 samples that we took, we only found 30 unique genotypes or 30 unique genets. That's really rare in corals. And it suggests that this whole population is not very well mixed and must be maintained either by just fragmentation or by something we call parthenogenesis, AKA a coral popping off a larvae without ever having sex, which is kind of crazy. What's interesting is that we now can say with some certainty that for Southeast Florida, the population that's most important to protect is Boynton. It's supplying larvae to all of the other areas. And there's a strong suggestion that that Fort Lauderdale population is really cut off from everywhere else. And as a result, it's become inbred over time. It doesn't have high diversity. Related individuals are now breeding with one another because they don't have anyone else there to breed with. So it could be a candidate for facilitated restoration where we would bring in other genotypes into that population to boost its genetic diversity. Next story is about a really cool blushing coral in Florida Keys. So this is one where again, we went to those shallow and mesophotic habitats across multiple different regions of the Florida Keys. And the reason that we really wanted to look closely at this one is because there were several papers that had come out for a couple other species that it said, it doesn't matter what depth you, met, you sample out in the Florida Keys, they're all well mixed together. And we knew based just on the size and behavior of some of these colonies, that was unlikely to be true. So we sampled shallow Stephanosinia and deep Stephanosinia in four different places. And all of these arrows represent the hypothetical migration that we can determine based on the DNA signatures, the genotypes of those corals. Long story short, those deep corals in Florida Keys are way more important to maintaining the populations of these species in the Florida Keys than the shallow populations are. They contribute disproportionately much more larvae, much more genetic information. So again, if you want this species to survive in the Keys, you need to focus on protecting those deep populations not just the shallow populations. And up until now, the deep populations are mostly outside of that protection zone, but hopefully soon that will change. Sorry, the darker lines are just showing you that the mesophotic ones are the ones that provide the larvae. The red circles are indicating the most high value areas um, to protect. So I've told you some good stories about how corals can persist and how they can potentially reseed one another across huge spaces in the ocean, resulting in these great coral uh, ecosystem services and fisheries that we get. Unfortunately, it's not always been sunshine and roses. Here in Florida, in 2014, we had the emergence of a new disease, a novel outbreak that started in government cut down in Miami. And it's been termed stony coral tissue loss disease, but which basically just describes what it is. It's a disease line where the tissue dies and sloughs off on stony corals. The challenge with this particular disease as compared to others is that its host range is enormous. At least 22 species to date have been identified with stony coral tissue loss disease symptoms and, and signs. Um, it's highly transmissible and has spread now from initially in Miami all the way up here to St. Lucie Reef off our coast and all the way down through the dry Tortugas as well um, as of last summer. And the mortality rate is really high. So up to 80% on particular reefs, especially those that happen to have those 22 species versus some of the other species that might be more resistant. I will be honest in that up until this outbreak, I was still an advocate for, we can manage disease by doing protection and trying to hold on to the diversity we've got while reducing other stressors. 
improving water quality, slowing climate change, trying to take care of our fisheries problems. This outbreak is the one that tipped it in my mind to that's probably not going to be enough. We're probably going to have to get more active about our restoration approaches, either moving corals or moving larvae or even growing corals on land that we then outplant into the ocean. So it's resulted in some big impacts on our reef. Um, essentially, all of the Montastria cavernosa and all of the brain corals at St. Lucie Reef got functionally wiped out. There are, or, were almost none of them left. We were down to like five colonies as of last summer. So the first question was, can we treat this? Can we get out there and actually do something to slow the disease? And some colleagues of mine, Karen Neely and Cindy Lewis down in the Keys, they went crazy trying to test all of these different potential approaches, and they started to get some promise with an acetate base called BASE-2B um, with amoxicillin, a really common antibiotic that probably all of you have used in just the past few years. We then took that and brought it out to corals um, in Southeast Florida and did direct tests where we applied it to corals and then had nearby individuals that were also infected but did not get any treatment, and nearby healthy individuals as controls too. And I'm really happy to report that we found a greater than 95% efficacy for applying that, that treatment on that individual lesion. So really high success, even looking out over several year, years. The challenge is it doesn't protect that whole coral from getting another lesion in a different place. So over time, Karen and her group have worked out that basically we have to go back to a colony about every three months. And if we do that and apply treatments, then we can catch new infections as they come and prevent that colony from dying. We recently scaled that up over the past two summers and went from treating like dozens or hundreds of colonies here in Southeast Florida to treating thousands of colonies in the Dry Tortugas. So we sent a team of 10 people out, half from Nova, half from my group, and we were out um, in the Dry Tortugas twice for a combination of, I think, 13 days overall. And we treated a little bit more than 10,000 colonies during that time. Now, we don't track them all, so we don't know what their ultimate likelihood of survivorship is. But based on the data for those that we have treated and tracked, it would suggest that hopefully somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 70% of these were saved by this application. So you can be really impactful if you have these dedicated teams of people that know what they're doing that go out and hit it really hard, but how do you scale that up to the entire reef or to the entire Caribbean because this disease has spread to multiple other locations all the way down through the Virgin Islands, uh, now into Bonaire, Mesoamerica, we not only need perfected techniques, but we need huge teams of people potentially doing this. And there's still questions about potential unintended consequences of antibiotic applications on reefs. So it's designed for a quick uh, three-day time release, and then it dissipates um, and breaks down. But in that three days, you still may deal with things like antibiotic resistance, for example. So it's a question that we need to address as well. So back to kind of what might be driving why we're seeing an increase in this disease. One of the first things that gets blamed anytime something goes sideways in, in Southeast Florida coral reefs is water quality. Whoop. Um, and so we wanted to ask the question, does nutrient enrichment or nutrient pollution make this disease happen or make it happen worse? Um, so Ashley Carrera, one of my grad students and I, we worked on a project uh, replicating work I had done on black band disease where we directly dosed colonies with osmocote fertilizer and had controls and compared them um, over a course of uh, a little over a month. And we did 3D modeling, we did linear progression, all these other measures. Long story short, no. In this location for this disease, adding excess nutrient amend amendment did not result in faster rates of tissue loss to this disease. So that might be because we've already got too much excess nitrogen or phosphorus in our local uh, water. So that those bacteria or whatever the pathogenic agent is, is already happy and doesn't need any more. Um, it doesn't mean nutrients can't play a role in other places, but it does mean that here in South Florida, 
There are tons of reasons to reduce our nitrogen and phosphorus inputs, but stopping certainly coral tissue loss disease is not going to be one of them. So we wondered, like, well, what else could be going on? And we looked at these data over time, and you can see that in both those that were amended and the controls, we saw a drop in the amount of corals that had active lesions on them over time. And if you overlay temperature onto that, essentially you see this really interesting relationship where once it dropped below 29 degrees Celsius, aka about 85 degrees, all of a sudden we started to see the amount of certain coral tissue loss disease go away. So it might not be nutrient controlled, it might be temperature controlled. But again, this is only a correlation. We didn't test the temperature specifically, so I can't say that with certainty yet. The other thing that's really crazy about this particular disease is you can be swimming along the reef and there'll be two colonies of the same species right next to one another, same size, nothing different about them. One is ravaged with lesions, the other one looks totally fine. And this happens in human populations too, right? Your, your spouse or your kids can come home with COVID and four people in the house get it and two don't and you never know why. So we wanted to ask, is there something about these colonies innately that drives their susceptibility to this disease? And this is what I lovingly call the kitchen sink project. So we partnered with about eight other groups um, to kind of take every technique that we knew how to use and throw at these colonies to see, is there anything different about those that get infected and those that don't? Our role in that was to look at the coral genetics because we're uh, very skilled and have experience in that, and also to look at the microbes that were associated um, with these colonies. I don't have the microbe data for you yet, it will be coming. But we looked at the genotypes, and this is work that my grad student Ali Klein has done. Essentially, this is a, a map of relatedness of all of those colonies. All of the little red dots are ones that got cerny coral tissue loss disease. If they're green, they never got cerny coral tissue loss disease. And what you see is that there's reds and greens mixed through all of these different lineages. In other words, genetic lineage is not a good predictor of susceptibility to this disease for this species. So just like in humans, genetic lineage is not a good predictor for COVID. It's other factors that drive it. It's the same thing for this disease in corals. There's not particular lineages that are tougher or more susceptible. From a restoration standpoint, that's important information. It means we can't bank on there being like a few corals that are super tough that we can grow a bunch of them and just plant those out. That's not gonna work. But how do we do restoration then? How can we test whether or not restoration is even feasible or prudent during a coral disease epidemic? To address this, we got involved with another huge project, uh, this time only six, or excuse me, seven different partners, um, to do what's effectively the largest coral restoration experiment um, ever known in Florida. So we split up the reef into these six different regions, and then we had uh, several partners that contributed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of corals of three different species into a huge bank that we could then fragment up all of those corals and do a replicated experimental design where we outplanted the same kinds of corals across this whole range to see, are they susceptible to this disease? and how well do they perform. Um, in total, just under 6,000 fragments have been outplanted. Um, we're responsible for two groups up here. Two of our sets are right out at St. Lucie Reef, and then we have two more sets down at Breakers and West Palm Beach. And I'm really happy to report that they're doing great. It's been 19 months now, and we're still at about 80% survivorship of those fragments, and in fact, Many of them, so you can see we would put five together that were all the same genotype on a puck. Many of them now have started to fuse together to become a new little coral colony. And this is exactly what we want to happen. So we're seeing success with this, which suggests that this may be a method for us to get more corals back out onto our reef and to replace some of that lost functional biology that we've lost to disease. And then lastly, as we started to work with several different agencies and partners on trying to understand this influence of Lake Okeechobee. Um, so 
hopefully you're a very well-educated audience on this topic. Most of you know that we're undergoing a, a period of revision in how Lake Okeechobee will be managed. We're going to go from the LORS operating system to the LOSAN system. We're going to have slightly different criteria and different thresholds. What was really interesting is that there currently is no threshold related to coral. What was even more interesting is when we started to go look for real data on coral salinity thresholds in Florida, we couldn't find a whole lot. So we decided if we want to have a metric for potential impacts of coral as a result of discharge rates, we needed to do that research ourselves. So Haley Davis is one of my master's students, and we did two different tests, one where we quickly were ramping down the amount of salinity every day, like a big pulse event when they just open the locks and things go crazy. At what point are the corals going to crash? So normal seawater around here is in the range of about 35 to 40 parts per thousand salt. Um, fresh water is obviously zero. So at about half of that, about 19 parts per thousand, is when the corals crashed in this experiment. So if a pulse release happened and that resulted in measured salinity rates of below 19 out on the reef, we can expect there to be mortality. And we've put out sensors on the reef, and we have recorded incidents of 16 parts per thousand on a, out on the reef following big storm releases. So that means that we do need yet another reason to improve the water management in our region to limit the amount of impact to corals offshore, not just for things in the estuary. We also wanted to know about, what about chronic stress? This idea of not releasing all the water at once, but trickling out a lower volume of water over time. So we picked an intermediate level uh, salinity stress at about 25 parts per thousand, and we just held it at 25 parts per thousand to see how long these corals would last until they started to crash. And we did two different species. For one of those species, it started to crash about 20 days. The other, we saw a slight dip at 23 days, but it never crashed completely. Um, and we ran that experiment all the way until we all had to leave to go to Germany last summer um, for a conference. But it suggests that, again, by the time we get to 20 days or about three weeks, we can expect to start seeing some impacts on some coral species as a result of these releases. All right, so I'm three minutes over, but my intro was long. So quick conclusions and a few outcomes, and then some things that I would recommend for you all to think about and maybe share with your friends, neighbors, politicians, stakeholders, etc. cetera. Um, number one, corals are total ecological and economic powerhouses. They drive really important biology and really important resources for us, but those resources and those services are threatened, and we need to do something about them if we want to continue to see those ecosystem services be provided to us tourism, fish, coastal protection, et cetera. Those mesophotic habitats, those slightly deeper, slightly more protected middle light reefs are extensive across our entire region, Gulf of Mexico, Western Atlantic. And that suggests that number one, we need to think more broadly about where and what we protect. And number two, we may need to think differently about how we enhance connectivity at vertical and horizontal scales to promote reef, re, excuse me, reef resilience. We've been, had great success with new MPAs, um, expansion of existing ones and revised management plans for others. Every time that happens, there's an opportunity for public comment and public input. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, for better or worse, you have a voice. You can provide written comment, there's opportunities for oral comment, both online and in person, every time any MPA is created or expanded. So exercise that voice and get involved. We know that these direct interventions, AKA applying antibiotics onto corals can save them, but scaling that up to be effective at a broad scale is gonna be a challenge. And we also have those uh, potential secondary risks that we need to address first before we would think about really going at, a, at an enormous level of antibiotic treatment application. And then lastly, we're starting to see evidence that coral restoration can be successful, but I don't want to create false hope. And I certainly don't want to anyone to think that, oh, it's okay if we lose these corals over here because we can just grow new ones and replace them. 
When we grow new corals and put them out, we're usually doing it on a scale of maybe, you know, eight to 10 inches across. That coral is not gonna become reproductively viable for a very long time. Those larger corals that we're losing, they're the ones that are disproportionately um, contributing to most of the reproduction on a reef. So it's still more important to protect some of these huge ones than to necessarily grow out a bunch of small ones. I think we need a both and, not an either or approach. So my recommendations are number one, start to expand this regional scale management approach. Look at huge areas, potentially even across national boundaries in order to develop long-term plans for persistence, not just getting hyper-protective about our little individual patch. We do need to advocate and provide input when we get the opportunity. And you're at the perfect spot, both geographically and time-wise, to do that here. So hopefully, most of you have heard of, the Chris, have heard of Kristen Jacobs, at least, um, and her legacy. Um, the Coral Ecosystem Conservation Area off of our coast is the newest MPA in Florida. It goes from the edge of Biscayne Bay all the way right up here to St. Lucie Inlet. It's a huge expanse of new coral protected area. The box has been drawn that was put into law in 2018, but we still don't have a management plan yet. And there's gonna be lots of opportunity for public scoping and public input on that management plan. Things like buoy systems, uh, areas that are restricted to anchoring, areas that are restricted for fishing, areas that are set aside for diving, things like that. We need to support those kind of innovative restoration and conservation approaches, especially kind of getting, there's a huge move towards all research needs to be collaborative. You can have strength in collaboration, but there's a risk of thwarting innovation when you do that. You need to also have some opportunities for the independent free thinker to come up with new ideas that don't get swallowed by groupthink. And so I think we need a balance of collaboration and independent researchers working together. You all know, champion water quality, particularly in your own environment. Um, local water quality is a local issue, but no matter how much we improve water quality, it's not gonna matter if climate change swamps everything out. So you have to advocate for both mechanisms to reduce climate change and enhance local water quality. Do your best to educate, train, and inspire others. That means sometimes being willing to have an uncomfortable conversation with people. I would suggest you do it over coffee or a drink of some kind to make it a calm situation. But don't be afraid to have a tough conversation just because someone disagrees with you. In this time of like hyper-politicized everything, everyone's unwilling to do that. But the way we're gonna get to everyone having collective knowledge to make decisions is by sharing information and having discourse. And that, that means, like I'm literally preaching to a choir here. You chose to come here, right? It only works if you all take this information to all the people who were unwilling to come to this. <laughs> and perhaps the best way you can do that is embrace that storytelling aspect. One of the things that was most telling for me is that for years we gave you know, really compelling data to Flower Garden Banks, National Marine Sanctuaries Advisory Council. But again, it wasn't until they actively interacted with the video with their own eyes that it clicked. And, a, and another short five minute video that we made, I think had more impact honestly than all of our data put together. So tell the story, don't just show the information. I'd invite you to come visit Harbor Branches Ocean Discovery Visitor Center if you've never been up that way before, open Tuesday through Saturday. Um, we also have recently reopened our campus immersion tours. If you'd like to come and get a more in-depth campus view um, of Harbor Branch, they're available now. Um, always, if you can, advocate and support science, both here and at FOS, I encourage you to do so. And lastly, I'm looking for more people from my team. If you have fantastic children, grandchildren, people in your neighborhood, they happen to be great divers and maybe a master's in marine science, send them my way. <laughs> Thanks everyone. I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> 
Great question. So the question was about whether or not microplastics are going to have an impact on corals in the ocean. So there's been some data uh, to date that has demonstrated that corals do eat microplastic and they can potentially be harmed. So microplastics are also a problem because they absorb a lot of other chemical compounds onto their surface. And there has been some demonstration that corals can be, be impacted by that in a laboratory setting. How that might scale up at, the, at a reef level scale is not yet known. Good question. Yes, sir. You spoke about applying uh, antibiotics. How do you do that? Great question. So the question was, how do we apply the antibiotics? So that, that base 2B is a proprietary thing from this company called Ocean Alchemist. It comes in a, like a vat, and it basically looks like toothpaste, kind of like loose toothpaste. So we mix the amoxicillin into that, and the silicone, silicone, ac silicone acetate that's in that encapsulates the antibiotic. We then either load it up in syringes and squirt it out and press it along the lesion, um, or we can even roll it out in our hands, kind of like making little dough pasta and press it into the coral. So corals have all of those little calcium carbonate fins and they grab it pretty easily. Um, it presses into it and it holds and it lasts about three days and that's when the, the, the base starts to break down and the amoxicillin breaks down and it disappears. You can get fast at it. We're, we're down to like about maybe 70 seconds per colony. Yes, sir. Great question. So we did a number of different experiments where we trialed different concentrations of the amoxicillin to look at what was effective without causing more damage to the coral itself. Um, and that ultimately was a ratio of, of between 8 to 10 to 1 by mass um, amox or excuse me, base to amoxicillin. Yes, sir. Um, so we... Ah, thank you. Um, he asked me to, to speak to red tide impacts. So red tides, thankfully, are not a huge concern in areas of Florida where we have highly developed coral reef. So red tides are primarily a concern on the southwest Florida coast. Um, and during times of red tides on southwest Florida coast, you can get fish kills and things like that that could have kind of knock-on effects on the coral. But because there's not well-developed reef systems there, we don't see a, like a direct impact of red tides on coral. Yes, sir. Have they decided that where the damage is, at one time they were cutting it off? Ah, good question. So he asked about, um, can you do amputation to a coral? Um, we've tried that. Um, and it is, so if you had a coral colony and this part over here was diseased, could you slice that part off to protect the rest of it? Um, yes. However, it's incredibly time consuming. Um, it was taking us, like literally we could treat like 80 coral colonies with the amoxicillin or we could do one with amputation using an underwater rotary tool, a uh, rotary saw basically. And Cool. I'm down. <laughs> yes, sir. So what was the impact of the deep water horizon oil spill on the coral Great question. So the uh, question was about potential impacts of deep water horizon on coral reefs. Um, we actually went out to respond to that um, with a, a ship in Submersible and did a 40-day mission um, immediately following uh, the deep water horizon event. Essentially, we got really, really lucky in that during that particular time, the path of the loop current and as a result, the, the distance of the oil's path was really restricted to the northern Gulf of Mexico. We didn't have a lot of oil or dispersant signatures coming down over Florida's coral reefs, nor did much go west towards Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. However, there were some deeper corals directly in that area um, around Deepwater Horizon, where they did see impacts on some of those branching corals um, within, you know, several kilometers of the site. Yes, ma'am. How much of a negative impact does a hurricane have on coral reefs? So the question was about how much impact uh, do hurricanes have on coral reefs? First of all, I have to say totally depends, both on relative location, intensity of the storm, and associated rainfall with that storm and the knock-on effects you might get. 
So one of the things that's interesting about hurricanes is that hurricanes are a result of increasing thermal disparity on the planet, right? So we have too much hot in the middle of the planet, too much cold in other locations, increases winds and results in hurricanes. So there have been years when huge bleaching was predicted and we've had hurricanes come through areas of the Caribbean essentially acting like giant air conditioners and cooling things off and preventing coral bleaching and disease. But in areas where we get like direct impact of a hurricane, um, you can't have full colonies can topple over. Um, so during Irma, for example, we saw huge colonies this big at St. Lucie Reef where the whole things were flipped upside down and back into the sand. Um, so we would go out and get those that we could that were still alive, and we would actually use cement and re reattach them to the reef. So um, there can be big direct impacts, particularly in flipping colonies. The other thing that can be a problem here is two things, both related to water flow. So you're going to have a huge amount of water being dumped in the region. Most of that's going to come through as unregulated into the watershed, not through any kind of lock system or anything. We can't control what's happening to that as it comes into our watershed and out the inlet. So that's one issue. Um, number two is that sometimes before a storm is coming, a decision will be made to release more water than normal to prepare for that influx of water. And that can essentially pre-expose corals to salinity stress before the hurricane's even coming. So there's three different ways that there could be some impacts. Good question. Yeah, that. We have a question from one of our Zoom participants. They're familiar with the Sabalarid warm reefs that exist off the coast of Martin County, but they're wondering where our local coral reefs are located. Good question. Do I, do I need to repeat that or are they all here? Cool. Um, so the worm reefs are basically what form the bedrock of a lot of the reef habitat all up and down the coast of Martin County. I and mean, if you go to places like Bathtub Beach, you're looking at a worm reef. Now you can have corals that can grow and survive on that worm reef. But most of the corals that we have here are just south of that um, in St. Lucie Inlet Preserve State Park. Um, again, many of those have been lost, but there are 200 new ones that we've outplanted there not too long ago, as well as some that we transplanted from other locations into that area. Um, so if you go kind of just north of Kingfish Hole, there are two spots where you can see local coral reefs here. But if you want to see good coral reefs, I would suggest you go down to Jupiter. Yes, sir. So there were some corals that yeah. were buried um, there, and corals, there, the area of corals that got worse off buried um, was a, a reef called Three Sisters, which was almost like straight out from the Hobe Sound um, refuge building. Um, that whole reef got buried after a beach renourishment project. In truth, there was never a huge amount of corals in the bathtub beach area right, to begin with. It seemed like everybody walked on it. Yeah. yeah. Well, the ones that are up near shore, those are fossils, yeah. right? Those have not been alive for 6,000 years. Oh. Yeah. Yes, sir. And then I'll come back to you, sir. So it depends. The question was, are artificial reefs impactful for coral health or does it matter? It totally depends on how that artificial reef is designed and structured. So we're part of a project with DARPA called Reef Fence, where we're working with the University of Hawaii um, to design reefs that are specifically for coral enhancement and protection. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do to a reef to enhance recruitment of coral larvae onto those structures. Um, you can also pre-load fragments of coral onto artificial reefs as well. Um, some things that are called artificial reefs that are meant for fisheries aggregation don't do much for, for coral. In fact, um, a lot of the artificial reef ships that have been sunk uh, throughout the Treasure Coast end up predominantly hosting an invasive uh, cup coral called Tubastria rather than local species. All right, we have a, another question from our Zoom audience. Has anybody studied the effects of siltation or reduced water clarity as a result of LACO discharges on our local reefs? So uh, there's definitely been uh, studies that have focused on uh, siltation and sediment on corals, but not sp specifically from Lake Okeechobee. Um, so we can kind of connect those dots because we know how 
turbidity and water quality changes as a result of discharges or big storm events. Um, and we can predict what the impacts would be in our local region. But even some of the species that have been tested for sediment impacts are not the same species that we observe here. Um, so I actually had this conversation with Jordan Beckler, another faculty member at Harbor Branch, just the other day about, hey, maybe we need to look at this in our region. We have time for maybe another one or two questions from the audience here at the Blake. You're cut off. <laughs> Anyone else before I go to him? I've, I've got a few. Yeah, let's get some new folks. Go ahead. We also know about Galveston and the ship channel. We know about the Keys and the clarity of wires. How do we explain the differences in a healthy area off Galveston? I can explain that one very simply. It's 100 miles from Galveston. So it's nowhere near the G-Town Brown. You're way out at the edge of the continental shelf in very clear, clean water, nothing like the coastal water that you see right around Galveston. That's, that's predominantly what drives that difference. Yeah. No, the coral survives, recovers, and does great. So you only apply it right at the lesion site. You don't put it over the whole colony. You just put it along the lesion. Um, and we have not had so they did some initial tests of putting the amoxicillin treatment on healthy corals to see if it killed them, and the answer was no. I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to all of our Zoom questions, but I do want to wrap up with one last question from a, a, a Zoom attendee. Where did the stony coral tissue loss disease come from? Uh, is it from ships coming to our area from other ports? Is it brought from currents? Uh, are weaker corals more susceptible to the impacts of this disease? Great suite of questions. Number one, we know it's waterborne. Number two, we know that it started initially in government cut after a dredging project. Number three, there's still been no pathogen identified. The fact that it responds to antibiotics suggests that it's bacterial, but there's also some other things that suggest it might be viral. Um, there is some evidence that it can be passed in ballast water. Um, I had some colleagues, including a former grad student, do a simulated ballast water experiment that show that it can transmit, and we know that sediment can be a vector for it as well. And the last one was, are weaker corals more susceptible? I don't know, and I'm not sure how you would quantify a weaker coral versus a stronger coral to test that. You have to ask them. All right, well with that, I, I wanna have you guys help me thank Josh one more time for an incredible presentation. And uh, I, I hope to see all of you again here in one week, both our Zoom audience and our in-person audience. We've got a really great presentation about Goliath Grouper. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you again next week. Take care.